All right, YouTube. Um, I've made videos about this in the past. Uh, hundreds of other YouTubers, thousands, have made videos about this as well. You've seen it all over the news if you're paying attention at all. But our president, Barack Obama, has signed into effect the National Defense Authorization Act, Senate Bill 1867. Um, despite all the reservations that he supposedly had about approving it, he passed it anyway. Now, <laughs> there's a chance that this marks the end of the Bill of Rights that you and I as an American citizens uh, are supposed to be able to rely on. Um, is it a prelude to the deployment of occupational forces in the form of the U.S. Army or for foreign mercenaries under the command of the U.S. Army within our own United States? Um, there, there's some important questions that need to be asked and must be answered about this. And if you haven't been paying attention to this yet, you've got to wake up and see what's going on for yourself. If you don't believe this video, if you don't believe me, if you don't believe what you've seen elsewhere on, here on YouTube or wherever else, do your own research and find out what's going on for yourself and, and realize what the hell is happening with this. This is a big, big deal. Um, I'm going to share something with you here. Um, Okay, we can only determine how such a potentially oppressive bill enactment can be by the past administration of such far-reaching actions by either the U.S. or other foreign nations, or should I say, dictatorships. The prospects honestly do not look encouraging. First, let me go back to President Obama, who by all accounts was, re was ready to sign the predecessor of this bill, which was Senate Bill 1253, which did contain such language that it would have included U.S. citizens as being among those who could be t detained indefinitely along with terrorists, illegal aliens, and non-citizen residents. According to some sources, it was after the amendment of Senate Bill 1253 into being redrafted into 1867, which included provisions 1031 and 1032. So right there, if you're not believing this, like a lot of you have commented on the past videos, Senate Bill 1867, provision 1031 and 1032, stating that U.S. citizens would not be subject to indefinite detainment and all laws preceding the enactment of the new measure would remain unchanged just as they were before. Okay? So why then did President Obama threaten to veto the new incarnation of Senate Bill 1253 that was now Senate Bill 1867 if American citizens were now exempted from indefinite army detainment? You must not listen to the words of this president, but look instead at his actions which will define who he really is and on which side of the issue he really stands. Obama has absolutely no reservations about deceiving the people as long as he achieves his agenda. The fact that President Obama threatens to veto this legis legislation was completely inconsistent with all the other oppressive legislation he's approved or supported in the past three years. I must admit I was not in the least surprised that the President did indeed sign this bill into law. The fact that he voiced doubts about it totally irrelevant because he passed it anyway. The fact that Obama did sign it into law and noted his problems regarding it only typifies his insidious intentions while not wanting to take personal responsibility for his actions. This was simply a political move on his part to ease the condemnation that he will suffer and falsely reassure those that may still want to vote for him in 2012 that he's really not such a bad guy. What lies in the importance of Senate Bill 1867 is in the manner that will now be interpreted by future administrations and standing U.S. armies. The draconian potential for this bill is absolutely staggering. If we can't trust the government to administer the law as it should, constitutionally be applied, then we should not allow the government the tools to enslave us through ambiguous legislation, and that's just what this is all about. When there are vague allusions to just who is considered to be what a bona fide enemy of the state really is, the term terrorist could be used to define a very wide swatch of those in our society who don't approve of what the federal government is up to, and we have that right. Just as you were going to be made a potential terrorist subject for storing food in your house if you had more than seven days worth of food in your house they have the right now that if they decide that yeah that's a terrorist only a terrorist would have seven days of food in his house that guy only has four fingers on his right hand he's a terrorist clearly he's a terrorist he bought fifty pounds of sugar he's a terrorist we're gonna detain him indefinitely in his own country regardless of what the constitution says and we absolutely have the right to now because of what Barack Obama has passed. Okay? You've got to understand what, what this is all about. You have to do your own research and see what's happened. This is a big deal. And you've got 
people wake up and check this out for yourself. Okay? In Russia, throughout history, many public uprisings have been brutally crushed by the iron fist of the Soviet army. During the 1956 Hungry Revolution, when Soviet tanks rumbled down the streets and machine-gunned any resistance as the peasants tossed rocks and Molotov cocktails, the question of military law and order became a savage reality. How did they achieve such a bloody victory? By using troops from other provinces, such as Bulgaria and Romania, the Russians were able to avert the refusal of local troops of Hungary to punish the Hungarian citizenry. Just like in 1968, when Czechoslovakia rebelled against Soviet oppression, yet simply asked that they dem democratize the hardline policies while still remaining within the Warsaw Pact. The negotiations lasted only days until high officials of the USSR determined no deal. Once again, foreign trips, troops from neighboring and faraway Soviet satellite countries came to occupy the Czechs and vanish any hopes they had of moderating the harsh rule of communism. Once again, refusal by local soldiers who might resist marching against citizens of Czechoslovakia they sympathized with was remedied by using foreign combatants. Now, Senate Bill 1867 could easily be misused under the same premise. Already there are calls for hiring foreign troops of other nations to make up the void being felt in the U.S. armed forces as we are presently in a peacetime voluntary recruitment policy that does not make enlistment mandatory as it was in Vietnam. There are plans to recruit soldiers from UN nations to serve in the United States Army. Now ask yourself whether or not foreign troops would have any compunction over marching against US citizens if they were ordered to. The, their answer would be just as it was in Hungary in 1956 and in Czechoslovakia in 68. This is one but many scenarios which Senate Bill 1867 could be used in an altogether different way than it was supposedly intended. Can you imagine what Machiavellian event could be orchestrated by the government to give it Reichstag moment it needed just to justify martial law? Doesn't Senate Bill 1867 open the door to this horrid possibility? Just the possibility. Everything's in place for such a situation to be realized. Let's go one agonizing step further. Suppose a certain president facing a certain landslide loss of the voting pools was to create a nationwide emergency a dastardly act of terrorism, or a civil uprising that the law had now been changed to accommodate. Senate Bill 1867 would be that very bill. All they needed to deliver the nation into a perpetual state of martial law that would no doubt trump a presidential election. The dictator would be in place. The opposition neutralized. Just remember that the War Powers Act, another example, was never intended to be used in circumstances other than under a national emergency in which Congress did not have time to assemble and the President of the United States was literally forced to act on a wartime footing. Yet in every year since its inception, every U.S. President had elected to once again keep the War Powers Act in force so that no congressional approval is needed. Was America ever intended to be in a perpetual wartime footing with the Commander-in-Chief poised in that direction at any given moment? No. Congress was supposed to grant that power to the President. Now, Senate Bill 1867 allows not only the President, but the Secretary of State, and Secretary of Defense to declare a status that legitimizes the domestic deployment of the U.S. Army. Do the math. Connect the dots. The deed is done, and once again, we've been lulled into the trusting words of those who can alter policy at any time. Amend a given act to shape policy to their liking, and ultimately declare a state of emergency that justifies a grotesque transformation of a free country into a fascist dictatorship under the illusion of a temporary state of emergency. The president actually doesn't even have the right to constitutional authority to dismantle our Bill of Rights, but we're allowing him to do so. People, <laughs> please, again, I'm not asking you to believe everything I'm saying. You don't have to do that. You don't have to believe what you see in these other YouTube videos. I know some can get out of hand. But I am asking you to do the research for yourself. Go to Google.com, go to whatever your search engine is, type in the NDAA, type in S.1867. Type in National Defense Authorization Act. Whatever you want to do, go find out some information for yourself. Go to the sources that you trust and find out for yourself what's going on and what this means to our country. Thanks for watching, everybody.